Did Leonardo da Vinci have ADHD? Leonardo da Vinci produced some of the world's most iconic art, but historical accounts show that he struggled to complete his works. 500 years after his death, King's College London researcher Professor Marco Catani suggests the best explanation for Leonardo's inability to finish projects is that the great artist may have had attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder ADHD. In an article in the journal Brain, Professor Catani lays out the evidence supporting his hypothesis, drawing on historical accounts of Leonardo's work practices and behavior. As well as explaining his chronic procrastination, ADHD could have been a factor in Leonardo's extraordinary creativity and achievements across the arts and sciences. Professor Catani, from the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's, says, while impossible to make a post-mortem diagnosis for someone who lived 500 years ago, I am confident that ADHD is the most convincing and scientifically plausible hypothesis to explain Leonardo's difficulty in finishing his works. Historical records show Leonardo spent excessive time planning projects but lacked perseverance. ADHD could explain aspects of Leonardo's temperament and his strange mercurial genius. ADHD is a behavioral disorder characterized by continuous procrastination, the inability to complete tasks, mind wandering and a restlessness of the body and mind. While most commonly recognized in childhood, ADHD is increasingly being diagnosed among adults including university students and people with successful careers. Leonardo's difficulties with sticking to tasks were pervasive from childhood. Accounts from biographers and contemporaries show Leonardo was constantly on the go, often jumping from task to task. Like many of those suffering with ADHD, he slept very little and worked continuously night and day by alternating rapid cycles of short naps and time awake. Alongside reports of erratic behavior and incomplete projects from fellow artists and patrons, including Pope Leone X, there is indirect evidence to suggest that Leonardo's brain was organized differently compared to average. He was left-handed and likely to be both dyslexic and have a dominance for language in the right-hand side of his brain, all of which are common among people with ADHD. Perhaps the most distinctive and yet disruptive side of Leonardo's mind was his voracious curiosity, which both propelled his creativity and also distracted him. Professor Catani suggests ADHD can have positive effects, for example mind-wandering can fuel creativity and originality. However, while beneficial in the initial stages of the creative process, the same traits can be a hindrance when interest shifts to something else. Professor Catani, who specializes in treating neurodevelopmental conditions like autism and ADHD, says, there is a prevailing misconception that ADHD is typical of misbehaving children with low intelligence, destined for a troubled life. On the contrary, most of the adults I see in my clinic report having been bright, intuitive children but develop symptoms of anxiety and depression later in life for having failed to achieve their potential. It is incredible that Leonardo considered himself as someone who had failed in life. I hope that the case of Leonardo shows that ADHD is not linked to low IQ or lack of creativity but rather the difficulty of capitalizing on natural talents. I hope that Leonardo's legacy can help us to change some of the stigma around ADHD. Civil War plant medicines blast drug-resistant bacteria in lab tests during the height of the Civil War, the Confederate Surgeon General commissioned a guide to traditional plant remedies of the South, as battlefield physicians faced high rates of infections among the wounded and shortages of conventional medicines. A new study of three of the plants from this guide, the white oak, the tulip poplar and the devil's walking stick, finds that they have antiseptic properties. Scientific Reports is publishing the results of the study led by scientists at Emory University. The results show that extracts from the plants have antimicrobial activity against one or more of a trio of dangerous species of multi-drug-resistant bacteria associated with wound infections, Acinetobacter bomini, Staphylococcus aureus and Klebsiella pneumoniae. Our findings suggest that the use of these topical therapies may have saved some limbs, and maybe even lives, during the Civil War, says Cassandra Quav, senior author of the paper and assistant professor at Emory's Center for the Study of Human Health and the School of Medicine's Department of Dermatology. Quav is an ethnobotanist, studying how people use plants in traditional healing practices, to uncover promising candidates for new drugs. 
Ethnobotany is essentially the science of survival, how people get by when limited to what's available in their immediate environment, she says. The Civil War Guide to Plant Remedies is a great example of that. Our research might one day benefit modern wound care, if we can identify which compounds are responsible for the antimicrobial activity, adds Micah Detweiler, the first author of the paper. If the active ingredients are identified, it is my hope that we can then further test these molecules in our world-renowned models of bacterial infection, says co-author Daniel Zorowski, chief of pathogenesis and virulence for the wound infections department at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. I've always been a Civil War buff, Zorowski adds. I am also a firm believer in learning everything we can garner from the past so we can benefit now from the knowledge and wisdom of our ancestors. Additional co-authors on the paper include Ryan Redinger, from the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, James Lyles, from the Quav Lab, and Kate Nelson, from Emory School of Medicine's Department of Dermatology. Detweiler was still an Emory undergraduate when he heard about the Civil War Plant Guide and decided to research it for his honors thesis. He has since graduated with a degree in biology and now works as a research specialist in the Quav Lab. I was surprised to learn that far more Civil War soldiers died from disease than in battle, he says. I was also surprised at how common amputation was as a medical treatment for an infected wound. About 1 in 13 surviving Civil War soldiers went home with one or more missing limbs, according to the American Battlefield Trust. At the time of the Civil War, from 1861 to 1865, germ theory was in its developmental stages and only gradually beginning to gain acceptance. Formal medical training for physicians was also in its infancy. An antiseptic was simply defined as a tonic used to prevent mortification of the flesh. Iodine and bromine were sometimes used to treat infections, according to the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, although the reason for their effectiveness was unknown. Other conventional medicines available at the time included quinine, for treating malaria, and morphine and chloroform, to block pain. Military field hospitals within the Confederacy, however, did not have reliable access to these medicines due to a blockade, the Union Navy closely monitored the major ports of the South to prevent the Confederacy from trading. Seeking alternatives, the Confederacy commissioned Francis Porcher, a botanist and surgeon from South Carolina, to compile a book of medicinal plants of the southern states, including plant remedies used by Native Americans and enslaved Africans. Resources of the Southern Fields and Forests, published in 1863, was a major compendium of uses for different plants, including a description of 37 species for treating gangrene and other infections. Samuel Moore, the Confederate Surgeon General, drew from Porcher's work to produce a document called Standard Supply Table of the Indigenous Remedies for Field Service and the Sick in General Hospitals. For the current study, the researchers focused on three plant species Porcher cited for antiseptic use that grow in Lullwater Preserve on the Emory campus. They included two common hardwood trees, the white oak Quercus alba, and the tulip poplar Liriodendron tulipifera, as well as a thorny, woody shrub commonly known as the devil's walking stick Aurelia spinosa. Samples of these three plants were gathered from campus specimens, based on Porcher's specifications. Extracts were taken from white oak bark and galls, tulip poplar leaves, root inner bark and branch bark, and the devil's walking stick leaves. The extracts were then tested on three species of multi-drug-resistant bacteria commonly found in wound infections. Acinetobacter bomini, better known as Arachibacter, due to its association with wounded combat troops returning from the Iraq War, exhibits extensive resistance to most first-line antibiotics. It's emerging as a major threat for soldiers recovering from battle wounds and for hospitals in general, Quav says. Staphylococcus aureus is considered the most dangerous of many common staph bacteria and can spread from skin infections or medical devices through the bloodstream and infect distant organs. Klebsiella pneumoniae is another leading cause of hospital infection and can result in life-threatening cases of pneumonia and septic shock. Laboratory tests showed that extracts from the white oak and tulip poplar inhibited the growth of S. aureus, while the white oak extracts also inhibited the growth of A. bomini and K. pneumoniae. Extracts from both of these plants also inhibited S. aureus from forming biofilms, which can act like a shield against antibiotics. 
Extracts from the Devil's Walking Stick inhibited both biofilm formation and quorum sensing in S. aureus. Quorum sensing is a signaling system that staph bacteria use to manufacture toxins and ramp up virulence. Blocking this system essentially, disarms the bacteria. Traditional plant remedies are often dismissed if they don't actively attack and kill pathogens, Quav notes, adding, there are many more ways to help cure infections, and we need to focus on them in the era of drug-resistant bacteria. Plants have a great wealth of chemical diversity, which is one more reason to protect natural environments, Detweiler says. He plans to go to graduate school with a focus on researching plants for either medical or agricultural purposes. I'm interested in plants because, even though they don't move from place to place, they are extremely powerful and important. The research was supported by a Howard Hughes Medical Institute Science Education Program Award to Emory University and grants from the National Institutes of Health, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health and from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. Phase transitions, the math behind the music next time you listen to a favorite tune or wonder at the beauty of a natural sound, you might also end up pondering the math behind the music. You will, anyway, if you spend any time talking with Jesse Berezovsky, an associate professor of physics at Case Western Reserve University. The longtime science researcher and a part-time viola player has become consumed with understanding and explaining the connective tissue between the two disciplines, more specifically, how the ordered structure of music emerges from the general chaos of sound. Why is music composed according to so many rules? Why do we organize sounds in this way to create music, he asks on a short explainer video he recently made about his research. To address that question, we can borrow methods from a related question. How do atoms in a random gas or liquid come together to form a particular crystal? Phase transitions in physics, music. The answer in physics, and music, Berezovsky argues, is called phase transitions and comes about because of a balance between order and disorder, or entropy, he said. We can look at a balance, or a competition, between dissonance and entropy of sound, and see that phase transitions can also occur from disordered sound to the ordered structures of music, he said. Mixing math and music is not new. Mathematicians have long been fascinated with the structure of music. The American Mathematical Society, for example, devotes part of its web page https colon slash slash www.ams.org slash public outreach slash math dash and dash music closing parenthesis to exploring the idea Pythagoras, anyone? There is geometry in the humming of the strings, there is music in the spacing of the spheres. But Berezovsky contends that much of the thinking, until now, has been a top-down approach, applying mathematical ideas to existing musical compositions as a way of understanding already existing music. He contends he's uncovering the emergent structures of musical harmony inherent in the art, just as order comes from disorder in the physical world. He believes that could mean a whole new way of looking at music of the past, present and future. I believe that this model could shed light on the very structures of harmony, particularly in Western music, Berezovsky said. But we can take it further, these ideas could provide a new lens for studying the entire system of tuning and harmony across cultures and across history, maybe even a roadmap for exploring new ideas in those areas. Or for any of us, maybe it's just another way of just appreciating music, seeing the emergence of music the way we do the formation of snowflakes or gemstones. Emergent Structures in Music Berezovsky said his theory is more than just an illustration of how we think about music. Instead, he says the mathematical structure is actually the fundamental underpinning of music itself, making the resultant octaves and other arrangements a foregone conclusion, not an arbitrary invention by humans. His research, published May 17 in the journal Science Advances, aims to explain why basic ordered patterns emerge in music, using the same statistical mechanics framework that describes emergent order across phase transitions in physical systems. In other words, the same universal principles that guide the arrangement of atoms when they organize into a crystal from a gas or liquid are also behind the fact that phase transitions occur in this model from disordered sound to discrete sets of pitches, including the 12-fold octave division used in Western music. The theory also speaks to why we enjoy music, because it is caught in the tension between being too dissonant and too complex. 
A single note played continuously would completely lack dissonance, low energy, but would be wholly uninteresting to the human ear, while an overly complex piece of music, high entropy, is generally not pleasing to the human ear. Most music, across time and cultures, exists in that tension between the two extremes, Berezovsky said. Anxiety might be alleviated by regulating gut bacteria People who experience anxiety symptoms might be helped by taking steps to regulate the microorganisms in their gut using probiotic and non-probiotic food and supplements, suggests a review of studies published today in the journal General Psychiatry. Anxiety symptoms are common in people with mental diseases and a variety of physical disorders, especially in disorders that are related to stress. Previous studies have shown that as many as a third of people will be affected by anxiety symptoms during their lifetime. Increasingly, research has indicated that gut microbiota, the trillions of microorganisms in the gut which perform important functions in the immune system and metabolism by providing essential inflammatory mediators, nutrients and vitamins, can help regulate brain function through something called the gut-brain axis. Recent research also suggests that mental disorders could be treated by regulating the intestinal microbiota, but there is no specific evidence to support this. Therefore a team of researchers from the Shanghai Mental Health Center at Shanghai Jiao Tong University School of Medicine, set out to investigate if there was evidence to support improvement of anxiety symptoms by regulating intestinal microbiota. They reviewed 21 studies that had looked at 1,503 people collectively. Of the 21 studies, 14 had chosen probiotics as interventions to regulate intestinal microbiota IRIFs, and 7 chose non-probiotic ways, such as adjusting daily diets. Probiotics are living organisms found naturally in some foods that are also known as good or friendly bacteria because they fight against harmful bacteria and prevent them from settling in the gut. The researchers found that probiotic supplements in seven studies within their analysis contained only one kind of probiotic, two studies used a product that contained two kinds of probiotics, and the supplements used in the other five studies included at least three kinds. Overall, 11 of the 21 studies showed a positive effect on anxiety symptoms by regulating intestinal microbiota, meaning that more than half 52% of the studies showed this approach to be effective, although some studies that had used this approach did not find it worked. Of the 14 studies that had used probiotics as the intervention, more than a third 36% found them to be effective in reducing anxiety symptoms, while six of the remaining seven studies that had used non-probiotics as interventions found those to be effective, a 86% rate of effectiveness. Some studies had used both the IRIF interventions to regulate intestinal microbiota approach and treatment as usual. In the five studies that used treatment as usual and IRIF as interventions, only studies that had conducted non-probiotic ways got positive results that showed a reduction in anxiety symptoms. Non-probiotic interventions were also more effective in the studies that used IRIF alone. In those studies only using IRIF, 80% were effective when using non-probiotic interventions, while only 45% were found to be effective when using probiotic ways. The authors say one reason that non-probiotic interventions were significantly more effective than probiotic interventions was possible due to the fact that changing diet a diverse energy source could have more of an impact on gut bacteria growth than introducing specific types of bacteria in a probiotic supplement. Also, because some studies had involved introducing different types of probiotics, these could have fought against each other to work effectively, and many of the intervention times used might have been too short to significantly increase the abundance of the imported bacteria. Most of the studies did not report serious adverse events, and only four studies reported mild adverse effects such as dry mouth and diarrhea. This is an observational study, and as such, cannot establish cause. Indeed, the authors acknowledge some limitations, such as differences in study design, subjects, interventions and measurements, making the data unsuitable for further analysis. Nevertheless, they say the overall quality of the 21 studies included was high. The researchers conclude, we find that more than half of the studies included showed it was positive to treat anxiety symptoms by regulation of intestinal microbiota. There are two kinds of interventions, probiotic and non-probiotic interventions, to regulate intestinal microbiota, and it should be highlighted that the non-probiotic interventions were more effective than the probiotic interventions. 
More studies are needed to clarify this conclusion since we still cannot run meta-analysis so far. They also suggest that, in addition to the use of psychiatric drugs for treatment, we can also consider regulating intestinal flora to alleviate anxiety symptoms. Owning a dog is influenced by our genetic makeup A team of Swedish and British scientists have studied the heritability of dog ownership using information from 35,035 twin pairs from the Swedish Twin Registry. The new study suggests that genetic variation explains more than half of the variation in dog ownership, implying that the choice of getting a dog is heavily influenced by an individual's genetic makeup. Dogs were the first domesticated animal and have had a close relationship with humans for at least 15,000 years. Today, dogs are common pets in our society and are considered to increase the well-being and health of their owners. The team compared the genetic makeup of twins, using the Swedish Twin Registry, the largest of its kind in the world, with dog ownership. The results are published for the first time in scientific reports. The goal was to determine whether dog ownership has a heritable component. We were surprised to see that a person's genetic makeup appears to be a significant influence in whether they own a dog. As such, these findings have major implications in several different fields related to understanding dog-human interaction throughout history and in modern times. Although dogs and other pets are common household members across the globe, little is known how they impact our daily life and health. Perhaps some people have a higher innate propensity to care for a pet than others, says Tova Fall, lead author of the study, and professor in molecular epidemiology at the Department of Medical Sciences and the Science for Life Laboratory, Uppsala University. Carrie Westgarth, lecturer in human-animal interaction at the University of Liverpool and co-author of the study, adds, these findings are important as they suggest that supposed health benefits of owning a dog reported in some studies may be partly explained by different genetics of the people studied. Studying twins is a well-known method for disentangling the influences of environment and genes on our biology and behavior. Because identical twins share their entire genome, and non-identical twins on average share only half of the genetic variation, comparisons of the within-pair concordance of dog ownership between groups can reveal whether genetics play a role in owning a dog. The researchers found concordance rates of dog ownership to be much larger in identical twins than in non-identical ones, supporting the view that genetics indeed plays a major role in the choice of owning a dog. These kind of twin studies cannot tell us exactly which genes are involved, but at least demonstrate for the first time that genetics and environment play about equal roles in determining dog ownership. The next obvious step is to try to identify which genetic variants affect this choice and how they relate to personality traits and other factors such as allergy, says Patrick Magnusson, senior author of the study and associate professor in epidemiology at the Department of Medical Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Karolinska Institute, Sweden and head of the Swedish Twin Registry. The study has major implications for understanding the deep and enigmatic history of dog domestication, says zooarchaeologist and co-author of the study Keith Dobney, chair of human paleoecology in the Department of Archaeology, Classics and Egyptology at the University of Liverpool. Decades of archaeological research have helped us construct a better picture of where and when dogs entered into the human world, but modern and ancient genetic data are now allowing us to directly explore why and how?